Hello everyone, so we are happy to start with the Odell case discussion series and without wasting any time, let's just get started with case 1 which is high Carey's great. Now the scenario says a 17 year old 6th form college student presents at your general dental practice with several carious lesions, one of which is very large. How should you manage his condition? He complains that his filling has fallen out of a tooth on the lower right side and has left a sharp edge that irritates his tongue. He is otherwise asymptomatic. Okay, so this is important that he's having no symptoms. The only symptom that he has is his tongue, his tooth hitting hard on his tongue. Then the history of complaint. The filling was placed about a year ago at a casual visit to a dentist precipitated by acute toothache triggered by hot and cold foods and drinks. Now this is very important. It says that he has had a previous history of pain with this tooth. He did not return to complete a course of treatment. He lost contact when he moved his house and is not registered currently with a dental practitioner. Medical history. He is otherwise fit and well. Extraoral examination. He is fit and healthy looking adolescent. No submental, submandibular or other cervical lymph nodes are palpable and the temporomandibular joint is normal. So nothing significant in medical history or extraoral examination. Now coming to intraoral examination, you can see the lower right quadrant is shown in figure 1.1 where you can see the oral mucosa is healthy and the oral hygiene is satisfactory. The there is gingivitis in areas but no calculus is visible and the probing depths are 3 millimeters or less which means that the gum there are no pockets the gums are doing good so you can see the mandibular right first molar is grossly carious and the sinus is discharging on its buccal aspect there is no other restoration or any teeth no teeth have been extracted and the third molars are not visible a small cavity is present on the occlusal surface of the second molar which is hair and it's not visible in the picture but it has been said that this part this uh, tooth that is the second right molar also has a cavity okay now coming to the questions first question is what further examination would you carry out now in this particular scenario you have two teeth involved one is the second molar and one is the first molar and the two teeth are adjacent. Now in order to understand what exactly is causing this sinus to appear, you need to know which tooth amongst the two is non-vital. Though it is evident from the clinical picture that mostly uh, it would be first molar which would be non-vital. But still in order to be sure you will be doing a vitality test for both the teeth to see which one of out of the two is non-vital. Okay. So that is why you need to carry out a vitality test. Then what radiographs would you take and why? So the first radiograph that you will be taking is bite wing. Why? Because you can see that this patient has got two teeth which are already which has already grossly uh, uh, evident caries. Okay, it has got grossly evident caries and you need to be sure and you need to uh, you know know whether other teeth are also involved or not because you know that it does take some time for the caries to be seen radiographically or clinically so in order to detect the caries at an earlier stage you will go for a bite wing radiograph where you will be able to see the proximal contacts of the posterior teeth as well as some part of the occlusal surface so it is going to help both in the proximal caries detection and to some extent the occlusal caries detection also then IOPAR of lower right first molar of course that is important because that is the tooth of concern here we can see the buccal uh, sinus tract so we need to see the status of the roots and the periapical bone then OPG since this patient is new to us so it's always a good exercise to have an OPG done which will give us an idea of the overall picture of his mouth and will also give us some idea about his third molars. Then what problems are inherent in diagnosis of a caries in this patient? Now you know that uh, this patient is mostly having occlusal caries. So there are certain problems we uh, encounter in diagnosing the occlusal caries. Why? 
because they are usually present in the crevices of the teeth which we call as fissures and they start subsurfacely like they start beneath the surface they are covered with uh, the sound enamel on top because we know that the outer surface of enamel is uh, super mineralized and it's very hard to break so usually the carie starts in the subsurface region and it's covered with the sound denti sorry sound enamel so that makes it very difficult for us to diagnose caries at initial stages right first is that reason secondly uh, we know that uh, the pit and fissure caries they have got a specific anatomy they have their apex towards the center which is uh, sorry towards the surface which is the narrowest part and they have their base towards the dej which is the wider part so that again because the so because from the surface they show very small amount and in the base they are quite big towards the center they are quite big so again that makes it very difficult for us to diagnose them clinically on contrary you see the smooth surface caries they have their wider base towards the surface and the narrower apex towards the dej which makes it easier for us to diagnose them at an earlier stage okay so that is the reason why it's difficult to diagnose the occlusal caries now coming to the radiographs they have given you three radiographs and they want you to tell them what exactly do you see in these radiographs so let's go to the radiographs one by one so in the first radiograph this is basically a periapical view of first molar so here you can see uh, the first molar is grossly damaged the caries is there and it's going all the way to the pulp there is loss of the mesial contact the mesial marginal ridge has been lost and because of that the tooth has been tilted mesially because there is no proximal stop to stop the tooth right so you can see tooth has been tilted mesially there is no proximal contact and it's grossly damaged now coming to the periapical part you can see that there is a gross uh, radiolucency over here it's it's going in both the roots the distal as well as the mesial but it's more evident in the mesial root and in the bifurcation area you cannot see any uh, you know any uh, any thicker bone here which we call is lamina dura which you can see over here this is called is lamina dura but you cannot see it here because it's already been damaged because of the inflammation that is going on there okay so this is what you see in an iopar now coming to the bite wing this is the right bite wing this is the left bite wing now in this bite wing you can see again this tooth uh, we have already discussed about this tooth so we'll not be discussing it again now coming to other teeth you can see over here the radiolucency over here okay it's quite big going towards the pulp so you can see caries here also occlusal caries you can see some caries here also which is quite little but it, it's still evident and you can see the pulp has been you know it has been shrunken because of the ongoing irritation over here right in this tooth in the right first molar upper right first molar you will not see any caries okay no caries is visible here you see caries here here and here okay now coming to the left side you can see some black area here so this is also having caries you can see some black area here and here again this is having caries some black area is visible here which is quite big so second molar from the left side is also having caries and little black area is visible here also so the first molar from the left side is also having caries now in these bite wings we can see that all the four molars from both the sides have caries except this molar which is the upper right first molar okay so that's what you see in the radiographs now coming to another question if two or more teeth were possible origins of sinus how might you decide between them now you see that in this case also you have second molar which has also caries and first molar which is grossly damaged so what you will be doing is you will be doing a gutta perka test in which you will be inserting the gutta perka into the sinus tract and you will be radiographing it okay we know that uh, gutta perka is radio opaque so the point where it will be ending will give us the source of that sinus okay so that is what we know by a gutta perka test then what's your diagnosis in this case so in this case the most evident problem is that of the right first molar so that is why we make our diagnosis as non vital right first molar with periapical abscess 
this non vital comes uh, in the information that they have given it in the information that after doing the vitality test the first molar was found to be non vital that is why we have made it as a diagnosis that the first molar is non vital and it has got an periapical abscess associated with it and also patient is at a high risk of caries because we can see in the bite wings that patient is having caries in all the molars almost all the molars right so that makes him a high risk patient now how will you prioritize the treatment for this patient now what can be the sequence of treatment that you will be doing so the first one will be the immediate phase in which you will be dealing with the concerned tooth which is the right first molar from the lower side so what you will be doing is you will be preparing the access uh, cavity preparation and you will be removing all the infected material all the uh, nerves and the pulp from the tooth and then you will be restorating it with the temporary restoration the importance of this procedure is that of course we need to remove all the source of infection at earliest because we do not want the tooth uh, to be broken down any further and we do not want the infection to spread in the periapical area any further okay so the first thing that we will be doing is removing the infection from first molar and temporizing it the 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 uh, purpose of temporizing a tooth is firstly it's going to um, make the tooth stronger okay so it's going to retain whatever restoration you are t uh, you are putting on the tooth it's going to seal the tooth it's not it's not going to allow any further infection to seep into the tooth and it will also help in the rubber dam uh, placement in the future appointments and it will also act as a proximal stop and will prevent the further drifting of your first molar okay so it has got three functions firstly it's going to seal the uh, the the chamber the pulse chamber from the external environment secondly it's going to make the placement of rubber dam easier in the next appointments third is that it's going to act as a proximal stop then is the stabilization of caries now in this case the other teeth are also involved in caries so what we want is stabilizing all the teeth okay getting all the teeth caries free so what we'll be doing is we'll be either doing it in a quadrant wise manner or in the arch wise manner we'll be removing uh, the the caries and we'll be putting the temporary restorations in the teeth okay so the reason the again the, the purpose of this step is that we want all the source of infection to be removed we do not want the uh, bacteria to be further eating up the tooth and doing more damage so we are removing the bacteria and sealing the tooth at earliest then comes the preventive care in which you do the dietary analysis okay so this is very important uh, you you understand what exactly is causing this patient to be more susceptible to caries right so you will ask the patient to bring his diet chart you will analyze his diet chart and you will see what where he's going wrong and then accordingly you will educate the patient as to how he has to take care of his oral health how he has to avoid sugars how he has to you know maintain his oral hygiene so that needs to be done in the preventive care phase now it's very important to know that this phase is not the third step that you do this phase starts right from the first appointment when the patient is coming to you you start educating the patient right from the first appointment okay so meanwhile you're doing your restorative processes the patient will be uh, you know making some changes in the, in his lifestyle and he will be more accustomed to the new lifestyle that you have advised him to adopt till then you will be completing all his uh, damaged and caries teeth okay you will be completing uh, the restoration on all his um, damaged and his caries teeth then comes the definitive restorative phase now once you are sure that patient has uh, you know he he is well motivated and he has done some serious changes in his lifestyle and he is now at a lower risk of caries you will start doing the permanent restorations in his teeth like you will be start uh, do you will be doing a uh, uh, a prosthetic cap over his endo teeth and you will be replacing his uh his temporary restorations with the permanent ones so that is what you do in the definitive restoration phase 
then is the recall so once everything is done you need to be sure that patient is maintaining his hygiene his lifestyle modifications in the similar way so you will be recalling the patient just to check whether he is doing all his uh, all the he's he's following all your advice and also to check if there is any new carious lesion in his mouth or not and also to check the response of the teeth that you have already worked on okay so that is the function of the recall visits now what are the temporary restorative materials which are available firstly uh, this is not important but still I will be covering this so first is zinc oxide and eugenol derivatives so the, the importance of uh, these materials is that they are bactericidal they are very easily available they are easy to manipulate and they are economical and they can be easily removed also but the disadvantage is that uh, they are not strong enough to hold the occlusal load Again, then you have self-setting zinc oxide cement. It sells by it sets by itself or by by uh, coming in contact with the saliva. Again, this is um, quite reasonable. It's quite economical, and it has got better strength, and it can be easily removed also. But the problem is that strength strength is not strong enough to hold the occlusal load, especially in case of posterior teeth. Then is the polycarboxylate cements they are better why because they bind with the tooth chemically they are harder they are more durable so they are used in situations where the tooth is grossly damaged and you have very little mechanical retention so it can be given in those cases uh, in case of badly broken teeth then glass inomer cements again they have got an important property of fluoride release and also they adhere to the uh, tooth structure chemically uh, they are harder they are more durable and they have good appearance also so again they can be used in grossly damaged tooth okay and they can be the important point here is that they are more durable as compared to uh, the zinc oxide eugenol cements okay zinc oxide eugenol cements usually can last up to six weeks but this glass inomer cement it can last up to several months okay now why is one molar so much broken as compared to others now there are some reasons why this uh, this first lower right molar is more damaged as compared to others firstly it was a previously prepared cavity was there because we know that while we prepare a cavity to receive the restoration we know that we are cutting some sound tooth structure also so there is a uh, a loss of tooth structure while you prepare a cavity so again that makes it more vulnerable to uh, have more caries and have more uh, and it, it it increases the chances of losing the tooth structure in future that can be one problem if it is not properly designed of course then marginal leakage in the, of the previous restoration we do not know this can be one of the possibilities maybe the previous restoration was not placed properly or maybe it, since it was a temporary restoration it might have uh, you know disintegrated with time and then it would have led to the marginal leakage which would have produced a secondary decay and that decay would have undermined the cusps and the marginal ridge which eventually broke off so that can be one of the possibilities then the third possibility could be the faulty cavity preparation in which uh, um, you know the the margin the marginal ridge and the casts were left uh, uh, undermined okay so that can also be one of the possibilities but we cannot be sure of as to what exactly has led to this problem okay the third uh, uh, possibility seems to be less likely why because in picture we can see some dark spots in the tooth which resemble more to secondary caries so it can possibility is that since this uh, tooth was temporarily restored the temporary filling material might have got disintegrated with time and that would have led to a secondary decay beneath that temporary filling and that has caused undermining of the marginal ridge and the cast and eventually the tooth broke off so should you ensure removal of all carious tissue while restoring the vital molars no it's not necessary we only need to remove the soft and flaky carious dentine which is actually the infected dentine we can keep the affected dentine there which will be hard and it will be stained now this is more important in case of young teeth why because they've got large pulp chambers and if we go on removing the caries completely it can result in pulpal exposure 
and we have seen that indirect pulse capping has got a better prognosis as compared to the direct ones. That is why whenever we feel that we might approach the pulp, we leave, we leave some amount of, uh, you know, uh, affected dentine over there and then we seal the tooth. More important is sealing the tooth, okay? So we need to have a proper seal. If we have a proper seal and if we have removed all the leathery dentine, then of course the teeth can recover. Then, what non-operative procedures should you be ins should be instigated for this patient? Of course, dietary analysis and modification for primary and secondary prevention of caries. Now, primary prevention is where you are stopping the new carious lesions to occur, and secondary prevention is where you are stopping the progression of already existing carious lesions. Okay. How will you evaluate the patient's diet? Of course, we are going to give him a diet chart and we are going to tell him to fill that diet chart for four days, which will include his two non-working and two working days because we see there are some changes in the way pay, uh, the person eats and how he, uh, you know, takes up the food and how he performs his oral hygiene. It varies from a working day and a non-working day, okay? So that is why we ask the patient to fill it for two working and two non-working days and he should be recording all sorts of food that he is eating at the timings along with the amount of food that he is eating. Okay, so everything should be noted. Then how will you analyze his diet chart? What is the cause of KV susceptibility in this case? Now, first, whenever we are given a diet chart, we'll be seeing the number of sugar exposures, especially in between meals. We'll be checking and we'll be, you know, encircling them, highlighting them. Then, once we are, uh, we are done with that, we'll be checking what kind of food is he eating? What kind of sugary food is he eating? If he's eating more drier and sticky food, that is even more dangerous. Then, any kind of snacking before bed, because we know that during night time, our saliva production is very less. So again, that is more harmful if a person is having any fizzy drink or any um, any sugary food stuff uh, before going to bed. Then identifying foods with hidden sugars. This is very important because people have this misconception that if they are eating tomato ketchup or if they are eating baked beans, they, they, they don't think about caries. They don't think about sugar consumption. They don't consider it as a sugar consumption. So we need to educate them that even such food stuff can also have hidden sugars inside and that can be bad for their oral health. So in this particular case, we see that there are a lot of highlighted areas where the patient has been exposed to sugar. So probably in this case, the cause of his uh, increased KD susceptibility is his frequent sugar consumption. Okay. Then what advice will you give to the patient? We'll be asking the patient to reduce sugars from his diet. We'll be asking him to check the labels of the food whenever he's uh, having any processed food. And we'll be telling him that natural sugars like honey are also as damaging to the teeth as the processed ones because people have this concept that natural sugars are healthy and they don't do any bad to your health, including your teeth. So they should be made aware that even honey is bad for their teeth. Okay. So we'll uh, encourage them to use artificial sweeteners because they are non-cariogenic like aspartame, saccharine. Then we'll be asking them to restrict their sugary meals, so, sorry, the sugary snacks to meals. Um, and in case they want to munch in between the meals, they can take cheese, they can take crisps, which are safe snacks because they reduce the pH of your mouth. Okay, they're more alkaline. Then we can also tell them to munch on sugar-free chewing gums because they have got an additional uh, protective role. They increase the production of saliva in your mouth, which again has got a protective role in caries. So we can encourage them to take sugar-free chewing gums. And we'll also be advising them never to finish a meal with, uh, with a sugary food. Okay, You will always tell them to either rinse the mouth or take some sugar-free juice or take uh, cheese or any other protective food that is going to lower the pH of their mouth, okay? Of course, after diet, you will be also telling them regarding the oral hygiene that they need to brush twice daily, they need to use a fluoridated toothpaste, why they need to use a fluoridated toothpaste, what is the role of a fluoride, how, how fluoride can make their teeth stronger, and yeah, that all has to be, uh, you know, fed to the patient. So the reason why we ask them about brushing is because we do not because because 
smooth surface caries they do have some role with the plaque usually uh, the occlusal caries uh, they don't happen because of plaque they usually happen because of the diet but smooth surface caries like class 5 or class 2 caries they can happen because of poor oral hygiene as well so in order to avoid the proximal caries lesions we'll be asking them to maintain a good hygiene because we do not want that plaque to be built up over the teeth and you know produce more acids and damage the tooth okay of course plaque has got more role to play with the gums but still for the caries also we'll be asking them to brush their teeth properly and twice with fluoridated toothpaste then assuming a good adherence and motivation how will you restore the teeth with the right first molar you will be doing an endodontic treatment with a post and core and post and core will uh, the post will usually be uh, given in the distal um, root why because distal root is straighter it's more wider and it's easier to prepare it for a post though in this case it's less favorable why because it's the mesial side that has been broken down but still because of the easy accessibility and easy uh, making of the post in the distal canal we prefer distal canals to be used for the post okay then other molars in other molars of course we need to give a definitive restoration amalgam is not recommended why because we need to cut more tooth structure to make a cavity uh, to receive amalgam uh, restoration so that's not recommended we can do a sandwich technique in which we'll be placing uh, GIC at the bottom which will act as a dentine and on top of that we'll be placing the composite resin so we call it as a hybrid technique or a sandwich technique or sometimes in place of GIC we can even use calcium silicate cements which we also call as bio dentine and on top of that we can place composites okay so both silicate cements as well as the GIC they've got fluoride releasing properties so they act as a good base as a good replacement for dentine now x-ray showing lower third uh, lower sorry lower first molar two months after endodontic treatment what do you see and what long-term problem is evident now here we can see if you compare it with the previous radiograph you can see that some amount of bone is formed because the radiolucency has been blurred though it's only two months uh, old we, complete resolution might take as long as six months to one year and in the coronal part you can see that this proximal contact is flat which is not how it should have been ideally so this can result in problem in long term why because uh, the cleaning will be a problem here there will be more food lodgement because there is no natural contour of the tooth which has been followed so this can lead to caries in the distal surface of the premolar and can also lead to periodontitis in this part so in order to avoid it we need to rebuild this proximal part by means of an extra coronal restoration by which i mean capping the tooth okay but if we cap a tilted tooth it will result in more tooth structure loss from the distal side while we are preparing the tooth while we are doing the tooth preparation more tooth will be lost from the distal side because this is tilted now the best way we can deal with this tooth is first uprighting it and then going for tooth preparation and then putting a crown over it that would be the ideal situation okay so then why not simply extract the lower molar this can be considered if patient is willing and he's happy to keep an edentulous space or he's happy to go with the implants in future we can be uh, uh, removing his tooth also that's not a problem but before doing that we need to consider his overall dental health because in this particular patient we see that other teeth are also affected and if the patient is not compliant enough it can happen that his his uh, molars can be affected in future and we might have to remove his other molars so in this particular situation we'll try to say whatever is there because his, the prognosis of his other molars are also questionable okay so here we are trying to save the molar by means of an endodontic treatment now what are the medical legal considerations in this case by medical legal considerations i mean say suppose you have placed some temporary restoration in this patient and you ask the patient to return after six weeks but he's not returning and he's coming to you after five years saying that you had done this filling in my tooth and now it has broken and my entire tooth is broken and I i'm going to sue you so in order to avoid that situation what you will do is you will keep a complete record of his visits what all was done during those visits what advices were given to the patient and what were the recall visits so everything should be noted down so that 
you don't have to face any problem if the patient you know you you don't know how a patient is going to behave so you should always keep yourself safe by having a proper record keeping procedure okay so this was about um, case 1 uh, please let me know if you find this 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 process to be helpful if you find these videos to be helpful we'll be continuing with them otherwise uh, we can go the same way as we were going thank you